engineer architect that we take our advice from. With the air the whole day too? When you want life insurance, you can call me. I'm going to call this special meeting of the Board of Education to order at uh, 6, uh, looks like 638. Uh, if you could please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Fire evacuation announcement. In case the alarm should sound, we have to evacuate this room. There are two exits here. Right to my right behind me, you go right through those double doors out to the parking lot. Or to my left, your right, go through those double doors, taking immediate left and through the double doors out to the parking lot. Uh, roll call, Kathy. Mr. Janaitis. Mrs. LeBlanc. Here. Mr. Feely. Mr. Grady. Here. Mrs. Suzak. Here. Mr. Serrard. Ms. Hall? Here. Mrs. Rancourt? Here. Chairman Neville? Here. I apologize for delaying the meeting. We had a, a special meeting before this meeting and it went a little bit over, so please accept our apologies for holding it up. Uh, item number five, board guest. Uh, I asked Mr. Bernstein to come up and uh, introduce the uh, program. You need me to use the mic or? Yes. Yes. If you could just pick it right out of the stand, that would be great. Welcome, everybody. I don't have to rip it out of the floor. Okay. Uh, this evening, we're going to award so recognize some of the athletes from both Enfield and Fermi that received special recognition this fall. Uh, it's real important to note that we couldn't obviously recognize all of our fine student athletes with all of the achievements they've had. But a few notes to mention. Uh, among our athletes, we have between an average of 82 and 96 percent of all of our student athletes in the fall <laughs> either achieved honors or high honors in their academic pursuits in addition to being athletes. Some of the teams were in the high 90s in their overall percentage. So we truly do have student athletes in this town and we're very proud of them. In addition to the recognition that we're going to give tonight, many of the athletes that will come up here will be recognized once, more than once, and most of them have attained honors such as all conference, all academic conference, and are also among the team captains in their chosen sports. So these are very special people that we are honoring this evening. And I will just talk a little bit about each of the awards and then the members of the boards will present after. The CIAC Sportsmanship Conference was just in the fall they have every year and they select uh, half a dozen or so students from each school around the state to participate in a conference to expound the uh, virtues and talk about why sportsmanship is so important and the, it enhances stuff that we know that they already have learned and I will tell you that in addition to the award that will be given in a couple of minutes for uh, Fermi that the Enfield and Fermi players when you break down in the soccer in football in field hockey the numbers of fouls, personal fouls, yellow and red cards, are among the lowest throughout the entire state, and by far the lowest that we've had in years on all of the fall teams. That is a testament to each and every player on each and every team, and we are constantly being told how wonderful our student athletes are when we go to other venues by their fans, by their coaches, and their players. The other Recognitions, there's a, a the journal inquires have a fall all academic scholar student athlete program and they will be mentioned in a little bit. The CIAC, we happen to have had three students who achieved all state honors and you'll be introduced to them in a while and a fourth that received another very high honor in the state and national level. We also have the sports department student athlete of the month which is an athlete has to be a varsity starter, honors or high honors, and has to be a good school citizen with outstanding discipline and a community leader, not just an athlete on the field. We also have an all area team selections, and we had four students from Enfield that were selected by 
the local paper as well to the all area and one student from Fermi High who was selected to that. At the end of the ceremony there's also a special award that we will announce that we're not going to talk about right now. So without any further ado I will turn it over to the members of the board and they will when the athletes are called up Many of the athletes will not be here this evening, even though their certificates are here, because they are participating in some of the fall sports, basketball specifically. Quite a few of the athletes who were named here tonight will not be here because of that. I'm going to have to peel this up because Mr. Bernstein's a little shorter than I am here. <laughs> uh, one of the things that the nicest things the board gets to do is to is to recognize students both for academic and for sports achievement and we really enjoy this is this is the the meat and potatoes of our job coming out and recognizing the good things that you folks do so I've asked uh, Vinnie Grady our, our, our uh, vice chair and, and Donna Suzak our secretary to come up and present these are the officers of the board so we can present uh, the awards to you I'm going to ask Barry if he'll read off the, the awards and the names and just a little stage direction here. You come up in front of us, receive your award, shake our hands, and then you go back. Maybe you have time for your parents to grab a picture if they want as well. Okay? So uh, at, with no further ado, I'm going to hand you the mic. The first set of awards go to those students who participated in the CISA Sportsmanship Conference. And by the way, we had two coaches from each school. Uh, Coach Jay Goucher and Rob Barnes from Enfield, and coaches Amy Bartholomew and Matt Gaffney from Fermi. And the student athletes who were able to participate in the conference were from Enfield, Rachel Khalif, Gabby Grossi, Maggie Richards, Laurel Sheehan, Michael Crowley, Kevin Kamage, Tom Meskel, Brian Murphy, and Ian Lempitsky. So come on up this way. Ian was also a member of the state conference that put together the entire conference itself. A few folks would stay up here while we recognize the others. The Fermi student athletes who participated were Connor Glettenberg, Dustin Stroka, Alex Zachary, Jason Despard, Lindsay Vos, Sheena Ware, Heli Kottenor, and Julie Pizek. Not to put anybody on the spot, but if we just go down the line with a couple of you, just speak out something that you learned about sportsmanship and you were able to transfer to your team during this season. I would ask Ian to start because he was on the committee that was responsible for this. Just speak out. I'll, I'll pass the, or come over here towards the mic because otherwise we'll be Um, so what we took away from it was pretty much that we have to um, be the leaders in our school that have to enforce the good sportsmanship and that it starts with us and everyone else is going to follow in our footsteps. Um, Anybody else want to say a couple words about what something they learned or saw at the conference that would like to share? Sure. <laughs> Um, while I was there, we had to go up and talk to, every, like, to the whole group about a specific thing. And for most of the groups, one person was talking. And what we learned from that is that sportsmanship really has to be a collaborative effort. We need to have leaders, but it needs to be that everyone is working together so that a uh, common message can be said between everyone. So, yeah. Now the two major leagues that we participate in are Fermi is in the CCC and Enfield is in the NCCC. The NCCC does not have a league sportsmanship award, but I will tell you, as I mentioned earlier, at every contest, at every venue that we go to, and at the meeting I was at today with the ADs, I am constantly complimented on what a great job Enfield High does with their sportsmanship, and that is carried through with the Fermi High School as an overall group from the 30 two teams that are in the CCC, they break down three 
or four award winners each season based on the division they're in. And I'd like uh, Mr. Newton to come up and accept this award, which presents to Fermi High School in recognition of winning the Eastern Division Fall Championship Sports for the entire conference. And Mr. Newton also is very active in the committees that promote the sportsmanship at the CIAC level. Thank you, everybody. Another one of our local publications in the area selects from the list of high honor students two of the, the highest honor students that are varsity athletes and presents them with a fall academic student athlete award. That's from the Journal Enquirer. And the recipients from Enfield High are Ian, Ian Lempitsky and Sydney Bellow <laughs> from football and girls soccer. And from Fermi High School, we have Connor Gluttenberg and Lindsey Vos. Thank you. And again, those were the uh, Journal Enquirer Fall All Academic Student Athletes. Next, we come the pleasure we have that we of CIAC All State and National or All State recognition from Enfield High School. And I'd like if the coaches are present, if the coach would come up with the student athlete. From Enfield High, first team, Class M field hockey, Maddie LaRusso and Coach Cookie Brummage. From Fermi High School, first team, Class L field hockey, Coach Amy Bartholomew and Marcy Maxada. <laughs> From Fermi High School, boys, first team, Class L all state, Coach Jim Russell and Connor Glettenberg. <laughs> we have another award of special recognition that comes from the national level. I'd like to have Coach John Mancuso come up and the National Soccer Association of America Senior Excellence Award goes to Liam King of Enfield High School. <laughs> Boys soccer. <laughs> All state and national recognition from the Soccer Association for Liam. Thank you. Congratulations to the All-State players. The next group. You guys until you get called back up. Again. <laughs> next group are the uh, Fall Sports Department as a Student Athlete of the Month program that I mentioned earlier, where the students have to be varsity athletes, honors or high honors, outstanding school citizens leaders in the school community and have a spotless discipline record. And the, uh, the honorees are from Enfield High School, Avery Boise from football, <laughs> Liam King, boys soccer, <laughs> Sierra Tresbach from girls soccer,
And from Fermi High School, Emily Quayle, volleyball. <laughs> Kelly Cottonor, field hockey. <laughs> Dustin Sroka, football. <laughs> and Connor Glettenberg, boy soccer. I would like all of the student athletes to receive the awards for a moment. If you could all stand up so we can all give you one more round of applause. All the student athletes who are here this evening, please stand up. <laughs> Congratulations to you all. We have one more special award, and I'm going to turn this on over <coughs> now to. We have a special award, and we, we, it's for Cookie Brummage. We'd ask her to come up here, please. Why don't you read this? I'm going to have uh, Vinny read it. The Board of Education and the Enfield High School congratulates Coach Catherine Cookie Brummage. Upon her induction into the National Coaches Hall of Fame, June, June 2013, we thank her for over 45 years of coaching excellence, commitment, and dedication to infield field hockey and athletics, February 5, 2013. I think all of us who know Cookie know that she's, she's done a great deal for the uh, infield public schools and for, for uh, sports, particularly field hockey. The highlights of her career, her coaching career, 46 years of coaching, nearly 400 wins, nine conference titles, five state championships, twice ranked number one team in the state, 38 all-state players, over 40 of her athletes played at the collegiate level, 14 athletic scholarships, two high school All-Americans, one collegiate All-American, and I'm sure we left some things out of here. I don't know how you did it all in those years. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you very much. This is, this is really beautiful. Uh, congratulations to all the athletes in the audience. Um, it's because of kids like you that some of uh, the old cultures like me have a chance to receive a nice award. It's um, truly no secret. I student taught in Enfield years and years ago, and it was the only place I ever wanted to teach and coach. And I've been blessed with uh, great boards of education to work for, Great superintendents, great principals, great athletic directors, co-workers, and most of all, outstanding students that really have laid everything on the line for me every day of every one of my coaching days in my career. Uh, this is very special, and I thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Cookie. Cookie says that she's been blessed by all of us. We've been blessed by your presence here, Cookie. Thank you very much. At this point, we'll move on to audience participation. If anybody wishes to, excuse me. Absolutely. Thank you very, very much for coming. I would not want to interfere with your studies or your uh, exercise. Go do your homework.
Next time. Well, I do know she can <laughs> <do that. laughs> If I had her for a teacher, Joyce, yeah. she's been here. Smart from there, Jenny. So we don't do all right. She has audience participation. We have nobody currently signed up, but if anybody would like to speak to the board, please come up, sign the sheet, your name and address, and uh, we'll have you come to this table and speak to us. Seeing no, nobody there, let's move on to the next uh, item, item seven. Action, if any, regarding the approval of the building committee recommendation for architect. Dr. Schumann, do you want to uh, introduce this one? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know we have the uh, a great deal of members of the committee, uh, including the uh, Chairman, uh, Mr. Daigle, and uh, their facilitator, Dr. Pongrance. And I don't know if you're going to come forward and uh, talk to us a little bit about the process you've used, and you can introduce the other members of your committee when you come up. And you folks have had a busy weekend. <laughs> we appreciate you being here. Thank you very much for having us. Um, as you're aware, uh, I'm sorry, my name is Randy Daigle. I'm chairman of the uh, school building committee. Uh, Art Von Grants, uh, town consultant. And we have uh, uh, Walter and Wendy, also from the committee, here this, this evening. Um, as you guys are, are aware that uh, Last Saturday, uh, we spent um, almost 10 hours uh, doing interviews with uh, four architectural firms. Uh, the procedure that we were using is called the QBS, Quality Based Selection. It's approved uh, method of selection through the state of Connecticut. Uh, a pro project this magnitude, we felt that it was very important to follow those procedures so everything was transparent. There was no questions on how and why things were, decisions were made. Um, the, what we did was we invited the firms in after they were shortlisted from 11 booklets that were submitted, 11 firms that submitted booklets, quality-based selection of booklets. Uh, we established a subcommittee. Um, on a, again, on another Saturday, we shortlisted those firms to the, the four that were interviewed. They were given some additional information called an RFP, uh, different information that they got them ready to present at the interview. They were given one hour to do an interview. After that one hour, five minutes to the end of the hour, I would notify them they had five minutes left. After that one hour, uh, we did a 15 minute question and answer period amongst the panelists. The 15 minutes is basically just a, just a time frame. Um, if it went over, it went over. But we, what we did not allow them to do is go over their presentation. They all had exactly one hour. Um, so after the 15 to 18 minutes of question and answer period, um, the direction was every panelist should have ample amount of time to ask any question they feel to justify their score. And we didn't want anybody to go come back and say, oh, geez, I wish I would have asked them that, or I'm really not quite sure. If enough questions are asked, everybody's question gets answered even if you didn't think about it. Somebody else might have, so. After that, we did an executive session where we went to the, uh, the private room and we spoke openly about anybody who has any first-hand knowledge with these firms, no hearsay. Um, I brought some performance evaluations from the state. Three of the four firms have done state work and also submitted it through the Bureau of School and Facilities, which is what they're required to do. Um, so we had a lot of information, we had a lot of good panelists that know a lot of, about the firms and about the field. Um, we have a vast 
majority of, of the talent on the panel. Um, so there was questions from every, every point of view. Uh, then we went back and we did that for each firm. At the end of the day, um, we went back into the executive session and we discussed um, based on the score. And once everybody felt comfortable, we did not talk who was getting what. Everybody came up with their own conclusion and their own ranking. They then put their score down, inked it, signed it, and handed it in to me. Um, at that point, Art made a copy before we even started doing any recording. We got a copy of them, we put it in a spreadsheet. The total number of points, cumulatively, from each panelist, I mean each firm, um, determined their value, their ranking. Silver Petroselli was the number one ranked firm. Uh, their total score amount was 1,384. The second place was JCJ Architecture. Their score was 1,306. The third place firm was Fletcher Thompson, and their score was 1,158. And the fourth place firm was Design Partnership of Cambridge, and their score was 1,080. After we had the points, we ranked them from first to fourth in the layout that we just, I just presented. And then at that point, we went back out to the public. During our RFP period, request for proposal period, we also asked for them to give us an estimated fee of what they're looking for for their proposal. But that number is four is that we wanted to, their, their, their dollar amount has no bearing on the score value. We wanted to know if that, we felt that we'd be able to negotiate a fee with them. If their number was so high, regardless of their ranking, we would not come here and ask for you, give our recommendation to enter into contract negotiations with them. So their dollar amount had no bearing. So after we did our scores, we came back out. We publicly opened the dollar amount for each of the firms that they submitted, and I'll read you those. Um, the lowest one was from JCJ Architecture at um, $3,198. The second one was from Silver Petrocelli. Petrocelli. Um, their number was $3,378,400. The fourth place, I'm sorry, the third place firm was Fletcher Thompson with $3,406. And the fourth place firm was from Design Partnership of Cambridge and it was $5,500,000. Uh, Art took it one step further to determine what percentage of the cost that we put into the budget. Um, our total, our total number was three million seven hundred ninety-five thousand eight hundred ninety-eight dollars was the budget that we put in for architectural fees based on experience, based on the nature of the project and the size of the project, and what we're asking them to do. <coughs> With that being said, um, even though Silver Petrocelli was not the lowest, they were st they still left four hundred and seventeen thousand four hundred ninety-eight dollars on the table, um, and there was a difference of point zero six from the lowest to theirs. So, with them being definitely in the realm of the, the ballpark where we were hoping that numbers would come in, and being so high scored, ranked number one. Our recommendation is to get your approval to enter into con for the town to enter into contract negotiations with Silver Petrocelli. Um, that's Any pretty questions much at this point? Pardon me? You entertain some questions at this point? The board Absolutely. Has? Absolutely. No questions, sir? Uh, okay. I think we've been kept updated by our two uh, folks, Evan, Tina, and Donna. Uh, and I think we also had some experience as we went through the pre-referendum thing with the, in the that uh, proposed design stage. And uh, I, I, my experience with them was really very, very positive. I'm, I'm happy to hear how they came out in, in this uh, uh, contest, so to speak. And, uh, and uh, based on the amount of time, which I know is incredible, that you've all put in, and you have our extreme thanks for that, um, you folks, I'm sure, have, have uh, touched every issue that's that's out there from what, what we've heard you have 
and uh, uh, I, for one, am more than willing to, to go along with your judgment, your assessment here for Silva Pets and Shelley. Uh, is there anybody else that has any questions at all about about it the process? Well, I, we're going to make it easier for you then. Uh, wow, this is great. It I, makes I, me look good all the time. <laughs> all right. I do need somebody to make a motion. I'm we're going to we're, we're, we're gonna take care of that. I'm just trying to deal with the. Uh, we knew that art good, right? <laughs> I had that note for you. Yeah, I, I have the email right here. I'm going to read it verbatim. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure people got a chance to, to ask questions and, and get any of their questions answered at, at this What's point the in time. Yes. Okay. Uh, there, are, there are no other questions. And at this point, I'll, uh, I'll entertain I'll a motion to, to approve this. I'd like to make a motion that the um, Enfield um, Board of Ed accept the Enfield High School Building Committee's recommendation of Silver Petroselli Associates Architects and Engineers for State Project Number 049-0138, subject to contract negotiations by the town manager. Second. Made by Donna, seconded by Vinny. Is there any discussion? At this point, do we have a roll call, please? Mrs. LeBlanc? Yes. Mr. Grady? Yes. Mrs. Suzak? Yes. Ms. Hall? Yes. Mrs. Rancourt? Yes. Chairman Neville? Enthusiastically, yes. Motion passes. Move on. Move on. Thank you very much. And, and we'd also like to thank Tina and Donna. Um, they're great liaisons. They bring a lot to the table. We have a lot he says of we talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> like you've never heard that before. Now. <laughs> they bring a lot to the table, and, and if we have questions regarding procedures through the education, they have the answers, and uh, we have the great support of the town with the superintendent. And everybody's been staying involved in it and um, just supporting us. So I want to thank you guys very much too. But well, we want to thank you folks for all the work you've done. You've only got another couple of years to go. I just, uh, <laughs> yeah, really. Hang in there. You've got our enthusiastic support. And you know what the nice part about it is that if you go around the community, people are excited about what you guys are doing. I mean, since, since, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable, you know, just uh, the tone that people have, how positive they are about what it's going to be, how it's going to, what it's going to look like, and just, I think, the professional way you guys have handled it all. So from our side, thank you very much. We appreciate it. <laughs> And we'll work with it any way we can. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Moving on to um, item number eight, uh, continuation of the 2013-14 budget discussion. Um, my understanding is that this uh, piece is uh, discussion related to goal number five, the new educator evaluation plan, and the board's priority to expand middle school sports. Dr. Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and you're absolutely correct. This is the third focused discussion we have for you and presentation regarding uh, parts of the budget. And tonight we will be looking at, as you said, goal number five and the board priority. Uh, goal number five is to recommend to the Board of Education a new educator evaluation system for your adoption uh, by state statute. I believe you have a copy of this one. <coughs> it's on the yellow. It's on the yellow right. tab. It's on the yellow. I don't know. Tim has it. Tim has it, but Donna's. Yes. He just forgot his phone. Too many meetings today. You got a choice. So, as part of this process, uh, eventually at the end of the process, the board will uh, be adopting a new plan based on some new state guidelines. The state. Uh, has updated their teacher evaluation guidelines, which previous to this were not updated since 1999. The theory of action here is that if we do design this system uh, and use it effectively, then it will increase the capacity of all educators to provide effective instruction in the classroom. Regarding uh, educator evaluation, the essential question or enduring understanding or the big idea here is that we know effective teachers are the most important factor in student learning. We know that effective leadership is an essential component of any successful school and school district. We know that high quality educator evaluation is the cornerstone of developing the capacity we need in our teachers and administrators. This is a quote from our Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. I would not give a fig for the simplicity side of complexity, but I would give my life for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. <laughs> Last week when we presented this idea to the executive committee, they told me it was too complicated, it was too much information, and they were exactly right. 
But this is a complicated and complex process that we will go through, and it's also very important. We have over 500 certified uh, educators in the district, and to make sure that all of them reach their capacity is, is a paramount to us. So what we've done tonight is we're going to try to simplify this and give it to you in a little shorter version and, and more compressed. These diagrams, or, or charts right here, show it all. At the end of every school year, every teacher and every administrator must receive a ranking. And that ranking is going to be based on a formula, and that formula will include these areas. And at the top, and teachers, it's student growth and development, 45%. And for administrators, it's how well did the students do in their building or their department, 45%. And the very bottom at 40%, our direct observation of, of the professionals at work, either in the classroom or as principals doing and department chairs doing their work outside of the classroom. And to the left, there's going to be surveys. Other stakeholders will weigh in. It may be peers, it may be parents, it may be teachers in the building weighing in on the work of the administrators in the building. And to the right side, there will be additional survey information, whether it be surveys of students and student feedback, or some type of a whole school performance uh, index. And then on the other side, teacher effectiveness. So the, con the rankings of all the teachers under an administrator will factor into 5% of that administrator's ranking. So it's a very uh, systematic program, and developing all these things is, is what the challenge is ahead of us. This is a simple timeline. Public Act 10 dash 111 mandated these new guidelines be put in place with multiple measures of student achievement as indicators of success for both teachers and administrators. In May of last year, the PEAT committee revised those guidelines and the State Board adopted them. In August, the State Board of Education and the uh, Department of Education began piloting this with 10 school districts across the state. By January 15th, we had to take, send a document to the State Department telling them whether we were going to adopt what the state had developed or develop some kind of a hybrid of our own. By April 15th, we must submit that plan to the State Department, and on July 1, we have to begin implementation of that plan. What we need to know is how things are going to change under the new guidelines. Teacher observations under the current plan, about 308 in our district. They will rise, there'll be 2,460 2, observations under the new plan. The number of goals that teachers will set under the new plan is 1,434, excuse me, under the existing plan is 1,434. <coughs> under the new plan will be 3,374. The number of goals administrators will develop is 125 under the current plan. It will rise to 546 under the new plan. When we do some very simple averages, and again, these are just averages, an administrator currently, on average, does 12 observations with written feedback per year. That will rise to 98. The interesting thing here is that that's on average, and at the high school level and the middle school level, we have a little more administrator coverage to help bring those averages down. However, at the intermediate school level and the primary level, those numbers will be significantly higher as they're the only administrators in the building for those, those people there. And the number of goals evaluated by each administrator will rise from 57.4 to 134.9. So the data is showing us that there will be a significant uh, amount of work. The State Department is calling it a heavy lift, to quote their, their terms. So what we need to do, we have to do three things. By April 15, we have to create and submit a plan for teacher and, educator, a teacher and administrator evaluation to the State Department. By July 1, we have to complete training our administrators so they can utilize the plan. And on July 1st, we've got to begin utilizing the new plan. In terms of budgetary impact, which is what we're here to talk about tonight, this mandate actually falls under two budget years. Our current budget requires to create and submit the plan and to train our evaluators all before July 1st. Then after July 1st, we need to implement the plan. So I'd like to show you what the budgetary impact for both budgets <coughs> currently is. The work we need to do between now and July 1st is to develop the, uh, develop the plans, 
Plans have to be built around five instructional frameworks, things that happen in the classroom, planning, instruction, assessment, and professional responsibilities. That has to all be put into a rubric which measures, which rates either highly effective, effective, approaching effective, or ineffective. Those rubrics need to be calibrated so that everyone sees the same thing at the same time. We have to develop all those surveys that we talked about, as both for the left and the right uh, small portion of the system. We have to design some kind of a data management plan because all this is going to feed into a number, and that number is going to be used to calculate our school performance index, which are the charts and graphs you've seen in the board conference room over at Barnard. So this all has to be quantified into a number. We'll need a data system to do that. We have to spend three full days on each plan training our evaluators. And then all evaluators must pass the state exam in order to begin working as an evaluator and utilizing this plan after July 1. The cost to get all this accomplished, we estimate to be between $110,000 and $125,000 to get all this in place. And that's out of the current budget. Moving forward, one of the ways we've proposed to accomplish what we need to do to implement this is to add seven assistant principals at the elementary level. A quick review of the data that you just looked at, teacher observations with written feedback are going to go up almost 700 percent under the new plan, the number of teacher goals evaluated is going up 135 percent, and the number of administrators goals evaluated is going up 337 percent. The budgetary impact here, seven assistant principals a salary of $93,814, and the total is $656,698. The benefits associated with those positions, the total is $758,723. The impact on the budget is 1.2%. And as you recall, the budget proposal currently is 5.98%. One of the things we've done is prepared a secondary plan that goes along with this. The secondary plan involves putting assistant principals at the three intermediate schools and using complementary evaluators to assist in the evaluation process. Under the new uh, C document adopted by the state, we're going to be allowed to use complementary evaluators to assist in the work that needs to be done. The state, as I said, called it a heavy lift, recognized that, and they provided for a different type of individual to assist. Complementary evaluators can conduct observations. They can co collect additional uh, evidence and data. They can work with uh, teachers to review student learning objectives. And they can provide additional feedback to both the primary evaluator and the teacher. A complementary evaluator must be a certified teacher and that certified teacher can be working or that certified teacher could be retired and they must be fully trained so they have to go through the three days of training in order to do this. It's important to know though the person assigning that rating in the center of the diagram must be a primary evaluator. A primary evaluator is an evaluator employed by the district working under uh, an administrative 092 certification. So they will be the ones who have to assign the rating but complementary evaluators can be used to assist in the collection of the data, which will feed into the data system, which will help us to give the rating to each teacher. The cost comparisons of the two ideas, we would have three assistant principals. Their benefits would be 43725 We've set aside $62,500 to pay complementary evaluators. We envision this being some type of an hourly uh, stipend that we would work with uh, people to, to establish. We figure we can uh, obtain somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500 hours worth of work uh, for this amount of money, which would greatly lighten the, the burden of the administrators we have. The budgetary impact, therefore, would drop to 0.61 and reduce the total board budget to 5.39%. So Enfield's response to the mandates of Public Act 10-111 are twofold. First, to work with a consultant to create, submit the educator evaluation plans and train the evaluators. Now the cost of working with a consultant is thirty dollars to $45,000. We'd be working with them. Some of the costs would be fixed and some would be used as we went on. 
And that number is included in that 110 to 125 I showed you. The reason we are considering and proposing using a consultant is that the State Department has also realized that they don't have the resources to train everyone and they've approved some uh, consultants to work with them. The consultants are currently working with several districts and they'll be submitting their plans by the April 15 deadline. We would be hooking up with a consultant who's already submitted plans for other districts. If we did this, the state said we may have extend the April 15 deadline to July 1. And so we would be working with a, a professional organization that has already submitted plans, already accepted, and that's why the state said you can go out because they're confident that if we're working with these consultants, the plan we submit will be acceptable to the state and they'll run it through their rubrics, we'll be fine. If we don't go that route, we have to get this done by April 15. And I'm pretty sure that the Deputy Superintendent Chief Academic Officer will be doing this full time. They'll not be available for much else because there's an awful lot of work to be done to create all the rubrics. We're also going to have to pull a lot of teachers out of classes to sit in meetings to do this and at a significant probably substitute coverage, but more importantly, a learning loss because the teachers will be spending time in the Barnard Conference Room and not in their classrooms. And the best part is that as we develop this plan, these consultants are going to do the training. So as we tweak something, as we find something that's unique to Enfield that we want in our plan, it gets built right into the training for the rest of the administrators as we go on. So I believe even though the cost of the consultant is thirty to forty-five thousand dollars, we would end up expending those at least that much of our own resources utilizing uh, Chris and Ann full time from now until when they uh, we, they finish the, the process. Down below is the response uh, for next year, how we're going to implement the plan. And we saw the two ideas: one was seven elementary assistant principals, and the second idea was three intermediate assistant principals and utilizing a team of complementary evaluators. We'll talk about questions and answers. I know I'm sure you're going to have some, but I'm going to just very briefly present the board priority because this one is much shorter and, uh, and much more fun. Uh, <laughs> the Board of Education uh, in, reinstated uh, middle school interscholastic athletics last year in your budget. And you were able to put in co-ed cross country, uh, boys and girls soccer, soccer teams, separate teams, field hockey team, separate boys and girls basketball teams, cheerleading, baseball, and softball. And this year we are proposing adding to that list. We would like to put in a co-ed track and field program and a developmental co-ed volleyball program. Uh, volleyball is a, a pretty complicated sport. We don't feel that the, the students would be ready for interscholastic competition their first year out, but we'd work on a developmental program, get the uh, interest up, get boys and girls both participating, uh, and then we would be able to pick up a few scrimmages against other schools so they could go out and play and some other things, but they'd only meet two or three times a week. It wouldn't be quite as rigorous. It'd be uh, something to gain people's attention and get them involved in a, in a great sport at an early age. The cost to do both programs with the three individuals who we'd be looking at, a head coach and assistant coach for track and field, and a, uh, a part-time coach for the developmental volleyball program, and some supplies to get them up and running, although there's a lot of supplies around the district already that we have in storage or currently being utilized, would be about $9,800. So I'm ready to return uh, and answer any questions that you have on either the board priority on expanding the sports or going back to the mandates uh, that we have to uh, meet in terms of uh, educator evaluation. Any questions to the board? Joyce. What is the advantage of having pilot towns, districts, if we have to implement immediately? That's an excellent question. Yes. And one that has been uh, asked many times across the state and one that has been actually weighed in on by uh, Mr. Mooney from Shipman and Goodwin, who has been used uh, as an attorney by this district many times. The plan doesn't seem to be well thought out. The uh, districts are being asked to implement a plan before we know whether the current plan works. In other words, adopt something that's being built as they're building, as they're using it. Um, the plan still isn't complete, and they do not have all the rubrics that we would need. We still need to develop our own, which is the cost associated. The NEAG School of Education is going to evaluate the plan when it is complete. Their evaluation is not due to the State Department until January of next year. 
six months after we've already gotten into a plan that we've evaluated or that we've created, not knowing whether seed is really a good plan or not. Mr. Mooney has argued that the language of Public Act 10-111 requires us not to have our plan in place by July 1 of 2013, but actually July 1 of 2014, which makes sense, giving us uh, a full six months after we hear about the state plan. That is not the vision or the uh, expectation of the State Department at this time. They're holding to the July 1, 2013 uh, implementation date and the August, uh, April 15, 2013 uh, submission date. Another question, Joyce? Yes. You have indicated that all evaluators must pass a state exam. And I assume the consultant that we're talking about would be having done the evaluator training would cover all the necessary material, or would it be our training? The consultant would do the training. We can either purchase training from the State Department through CREC, or we can use our own evaluate our consultants that would be working with us who we know and would be preparing us, not only as a three-day training, but throughout the whole process knowing what our district would need, and we could actually do some advanced training on our own at no cost through ADCO and our, our regular monthly meetings. It's it, the idea that the question I have is has to do with the state exam. Will everybody be getting the same evaluator training? The well, supposedly the the training is geared towards the guidelines of the state uh, test. Everyone will take the same test. The training will be given by, uh, in our case, CREC is our uh, local uh, education uh, resource center, but there's five others around the state as well, which are all going to be providing training along with uh, these consultants who are, who are working with the State Department. So we would not get the verbatim same training, nor will anyone else, from one rest to the next. Uh, Donna? I guess, I don't know. We had our representatives in, and we had our state center in, and we talked to them over and over and over and over again about unfunded mandates. All the ones we do, we do unfunded mandates. Here it is, it's a brand spanky new one. We can even put a price tag on it. Dr. Schumann showed us two ways, how much it costs, how much it influences our budget. Honestly, I don't think this makes education any better for our students. We now have over-tested students and over-evaluated teachers. Why don't we just teach? I think we need motivated students, we need good things in the classroom, and we need to tell the state, forget it. I think, uh, well said. Thank you. I guess I'd, I'd like to be able to, uh, to uh, uh, clap and cheer as well, but I, I think I know what the, the state's version of that is, is that uh, if we didn't do it, we would be penalized out of our ECS money and then we'd have some other issues to deal with. I don't think we have a choice here. The question, I have several questions for you. One, and I may have misunderstood you when we talked uh, a week or so ago, um, but if we go with the consultant, we have the same consultant for all the training, correct? Yes. If we go with, if we go with CREC, we'll have different people coming in, and we could have different people coming in, and so there'll be no continuity between the people who, who know our teachers, know our district, and so on. And having gone through some of the previous training they've had, my own feeling was having the same person do it, <coughs> getting to know our district, knowing the issues around our district and stuff like that and our personnel, um, there's a benefit to that. that. That's just from personal experience. You're correct. There's no guarantee when we go to the uh, correct that we'll get the same person for all the training. Okay, the second question I have has to do with the specificity of the training for specialists. Because I know, in having served on an evaluation committee for 20 some odd years, there was always an, it wasn't the classroom teacher that was the uh, the issue. The, because there's a certain uh, a generic way to look at at, at learning in a, in a in a classroom, but looking at a special ed, a speech and language, a guidance counselor, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, those were the ones that uh, had to be specially prepared for. And who, who would be doing those rubrics for those folks? Who would be putting those things together? The consultant or the, our The consultant group? would put them all together. They work through a process of uh, using Google Docs, where they put the work sure together, does. and our committee then can, in live time, work with them from at home, from wherever it is. So it's, a, it's a fluent process that keeps going on throughout the, 
the whole building of the document. But the consultant will be writing all the rubrics, and as I said, they've already done several districts, so they, they, they're vetting this out and getting it done now. Um, would it be fair to say that uh, you're not going to have an answer to whether the state will extend this uh, or accept Mr. Mooney's uh, uh, version or uh, interpretation of the law uh, versus their, their own or the agreement they signed with the feds to uh, get us out of No Child Left Behind? Well, you make a very good point. They may not be in a position to extend the deadline because of a commitment they've made to the federal government uh, for the ESEA waiver. Uh, they have not. Um, they've let us know that they're not going to accept Mr. Mooney's interpretation. Um, but I was, I, I keep, I'm very optimistic every time I hear that the commissioner is going to make an announcement. And uh, he made one today, but it did not concern <laughs> this. So I'm always hopeful, but uh, forthcoming, there has been no indication from the State Department they're going to extend these deadlines. Um, yeah, again, I may, be, I may be mistaken, but if we go with the consultant, uh, it would appear that that's something that's doable. Okay, with our current staffing and with, with the, the cost that you've tacked on to that particular option. If we go with having uh, Chris and Ann do this or Chris and, and Tom do this uh, for the next few months, it, it doesn't seem doable with all the other work we've, we've, we've given to these folks to do. Um, do. Do you have a preference? First of all, I think you're right, and I'm very fearful of losing two members of the cabinet to one project for a significant amount of time. Um, I, I think that the consultant is the doable method. And even though, and I wanted to show you the cost, I think the unforeseen cost of losing Chris and Ann uh, would be the same. For instance, Chris handles all of the expulsions. If he's not available to do that, either I would then not be able to do what I'm going to be doing on a regular basis, or we'd have to hire one of our attorneys to run those. We could easily uh, expend half the money just in in that. Any other questions here? Yeah, Jen. I know that you're introducing the seven elementary assistant principals. Would they be like a 12-month assistant principal? Is, and are they going to be in the schools all the time? I feel as though even though you're introducing this as for seed, they could be used so much because our assistant principals seem a little more overstretched currently because of all the different issues with behavioral and everything like that, that having an assistant principal besides to do these evaluations would be such an asset in the school system. Well, you're, that's, that's a great point and one that is not in, uh, indicated here. These are built on 12 months. I would think we could reduce it, uh, um, that $93,000 salary if we were to look at 10 months, uh, perhaps. I'm going to roughly guess, you know, if we were able to take three of them, it might bring it down $30,000, $35,000 by making them 10 months. And you'd be, you're absolutely right. That while the students were in session, the, uh, the extra hands would be there to help with evaluation of teachers while they were in session, and then the, uh, the principal would stay on for the summer. That would be a, a good option for us to look at and another way to save some additional funds. Perhaps you could you know, kind of come up with some figures on, on that. We will definitely do that. Okay, as, as we, as I think it's a, it's a good question on your part, Jenna. A lot of schools do do 10 months at the uh, elementary level. And I just think when um, when I was looking through the book, I noticed that the K-2 to um, only has, like we have four K-2s to and there's only two counselors and they have to you know, go between the two schools, and that's something that all the principals asked for. And having the assistant principal to help with any kind of behavioral issues or anything like that would be a great asset to them. And I mean, even in three to five, I mean, in Mrs. Ingalls, you know, r room, there's like constantly a kid in there. So it would be wonderful to have another assistant principal and another set of eyes. I think it would be. I think they should have always had an assistant principal in elementary schools, just for that purpose. It, in an average day, with all the how many hours they have to evaluate, on an average day, how how much of their day will be spent doing this seed business? You know, when I'm going to speak from my personal experiences back when I was a building administrator, Mr. Neville can probably share his as well. Um, you know, you schedule an evaluation for a third period with the biology teacher, and third period <coughs> rolls around, and things are happening such that you have your secretary call up and you tell the biology teacher you won't be making it down today uh, because you just can't leave the work that's that's pressing at the time. Um, I would think that uh, 
principals would probably try to be scheduling you know, six to eight observations a week uh, and getting into classrooms and meeting with, with their, their teachers. Um, and hopefully they would be able to accomplish that and not get backed up to the point where they couldn't in order to do this right. If you pile too much on top, you know, to do this right and, and have a sincere, honest, uh, critical friend type uh, conversation about improving teaching, you have to be focused on it. And uh, I would think that six to eight would be more than he would handle if the parameters of the day and the urgency of what was going on would allow for that. Other questions? Any? Well, Don, I'll agree with you. We've been on the board for a few years now, and all these unfunded mandates are, I can think, can drive any school board uh, nuts. But I want to talk about something better than the unfunded mandates. How about the school sports or the high school or junior high sports? Uh, <laughs> um, I see you want to propose bringing the um, co-ed track and field and the co-ed de developmental volleyball in, which is a good idea. My question is, if you can get me a price tag on it, somehow from Mr. Bernstein, the freshman sports in high schools. Um, I'd like to see some of that brought back if we could, because you have these kids doing uh, sports in, in the middle schools, and then they lose it in their first year in high school. So I'd like to see them implement something back if we can, if we can get a, a price tag on that, if possible. We can definitely do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, go ahead. Yes. On these evaluations, is this, um, K to 12, the teachers? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not K 12. On the number of evaluations, is this is this K to 12? Yes. Okay, now. And administrators. Right, currently the department heads do evaluations as well, correct? They do observations. They do uh, but they're, they're not working me. as I do they, know the difference. Right. Yeah. All right, so some of the, so that would relieve them of doing that, correct? At we these, would no longer need observations? Oh no, we'd have a lot of observations. Oh, no. Um, we have observations and evaluations. E evaluation. Have teaching. <laughs> <laughs> evaluation and is the teams. final rating uh, at the end. The determination whether a teacher is highly effective, effective, approaching effective, or ineffective. That has to be done by one of our current administrators. Okay. We, you know, the model we're using in Enfield currently does use a type of complementary evaluator, although it's more or less informal. The the department heads are in the classrooms observing teachers and then I would assume sharing that information with the principals in the building. This would formalize that process and utilize them a little bit better. We've taken into account that they will be there to help out at the secondary level where most of our department chairs are. The issue is that our principals at the elementary level, the K-5 buildings, are really one person shows. They're the, they're the only game in town. They've got the whole building to take care of and that's why we we're trying to find some additional folks to be able to help them out. So we're going to do eight times the number of observations we do now. Uh, According to the new guidelines. I, I, I'm just stunned at the overkill. I, I really am. I, from a business standpoint, I mean, you showed the statistics on, you know, the town of Enfield. Yeah, we have some improvement we could use. But nowhere near are we at a level that this is what we should be doing. I, I'm I'm just appalled. I, I don't know. I don't know where we're going to get on the right course. Well, I, I I have to agree with you in terms of the amount that are out there, and I yeah I'd have to add something else in. And correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Schumann. The types of evaluations you did on an off year now, you could go in, do a pre-conference, go into the evaluation, do a summary, but you wouldn't actually write up the observation. It wasn't that extra time you're in there. Not, yes, okay, you're, particularly you're if a person. Actually do this. Okay, and so now my understanding is all of them have to go through a, a formal observation, pre-conference, uh, you know, the observation, and then a, a written uh, document at the end that uh, they, they would all sign off on. Correct. We do hope, though, to be able to utilize our iPads and uh, to create a good part of the observation feedback using the iPads in real time so that the teacher actually, as you know, sometimes it takes a day or two to get that written, written up. Sometimes you, you do it all weekend we would be able to provide feedback almost instantaneously as the observer left the classroom so the teacher would have feedback uh, within the hour uh, on their, and then they could do the follow-up conversation. Because the feedback has to be very, very tailored to, you know, the, the rubric and, and, and so on, correct? That is correct, and that's why we, we'd be designing the, the, um, the companies that we would be working with included in that, um, that fee there that you saw, the total 
would take our rubrics and then tailor them to an iPad application that would allow us to use it here in the district. Okay. In my ideal world, I'd like to go along with Donna saying that this is an unfunded mandate. And as much as we all hate to be rushed on anything, we're being rushed on this. And it seems like uh, we're getting dinner ready, but we're not ready to cook it yet. And, and, and it, it, it's just not, it, 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 something's wrong here. Yeah, because we're looking at 13 observations a day. If we, if we look at all 180 days of the school year. Now, personally, I don't want teachers evaluated before holidays yeah. on half days. I don't think that's fair. Doesn't make sense. I think, you know, so now I'm going to have to lower that. So what am I doing? I'm doing 20 observations a day. No, I think I misled you on the, on the data there. Um, <laughs> it says 2,460 observations. That's district wide. That's the whole. At the end of the year, Enfield will have a. If we put them all in one place, we'd have that many observations conducted by our. Correct. Our which means they're going to be doing about 20 a day on, on good days. No, we could spread. Oh, oh, across the district with all. Across the district. You're absolutely Still, right. Yeah, but I yes, mean, I understand you, what you're saying. Right. Now. I'm sorry. You know, so basically, that's over one per building. Mm -hmm. So, it just seems it's just. These are professionals. I mean. And we have good ways of observing our professionals. I mean, we get feedback just from the teacher from one year to the next. I mean, you get parent feedback, whether you like it or not all the time. So I don't know. This is something that I just, I just, I would wish Hartford and Washington, D.C. would listen. I think that'd be a good thing. I'd like to, I'd like to change the subject a little bit and get to their, the, the, uh, the changes that you made in, in the uh, in the budget, and talk about particularly the cost of money that goes into it has to be done in 2012-2013, which involved meeting a deadline, uh, in hiring a consultant to meet the deadline to get the training done. That's that's one piece of it. Okay, and the second piece is what happens in this, the money that we need for the positions and, and so on and, and training <laughs> in the second year. Um, it seems that we're not going to find out tomorrow or, or the next week or so, and maybe the next month or so, whether they're going to give us an extension. Okay, they may, they may not, and to get it so it gets reasonable and gets gets to the point where we have the evaluation of the pilot before we start implementing our new program. Um, it would seem to me to make sense to get something before us to get that first step going. Because if we won't waste our time, we have to do something. Getting the rubric ready, no matter how many uh, observations we do, has to be done. And so perhaps uh, you could come to us uh, 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 with, a, with a discussion of how we could do that. Maybe have Tony tell us whether there's any money there to do it. I think it was thirty to 45000 or maybe pin down those numbers a little bit better. Because it seems like it has to be done no matter what. You're correct. And the nice thing about this, this well, we're not actually going to actually have to write a check for a large amount of money. It's a pay-as-you-go process. Um, and the initial thoughts here would be to freeze the budget of non-essential items for a period of time, let us get started, watch our health benefits account, watch our salary account as we get close to the end of the year, um, and then we may be able to loosen up the, uh, the freeze on certain things and as we get further into the document. We'll, we'll prepare something for you so you can see exactly what our strategy is. But we're already trying to save 150,000. Yes. yes. <laughs> but but I, I think, you know, with the, with the, the board's consent, to have them present something to us next week mm -hmm. as to is it possible? I mean, before we can make a decision, we've got to know whether it's possible and whether we can find that money to get that process started. The second year question in terms of the staffing, and I appreciate, I think I'm sure the board does too, that you, you did a plan B to look at it to see where we could get, we could go that that next step here. Um, I, I think we, we may find out some more as we go through the budget process mm -hmm. as to whether they're going to extend it or not, right. which will give us some leeway as we pursue the budget. That's just my two cents. Mm -hmm. Jen? Jeff, which one do you prefer, the seven elementary or the three? I mean, do you see the value added in the seven elementary or is it just me? Well, you know, I think me? if you ask me, oh. If I took me to a car lot and asked me if I'd like the most expensive one or, or the one with a few less bells and whistles, yeah. I would like the most expensive one. But, but recognizing and talking with our, uh, our principals, 
we feel we can uh, do a nice job here in Enfield with the uh, with the complementary evaluators and working on that system. And actually, we're quite excited about that because we know we've got some real talented people out there who could uh, who could help us out and and, uh, and connect with our teachers and share some things. So, um, I would always like to have uh, the most expensive uh, car on the lot, but I, I don't believe we'll sacrifice anything uh, going with a system of three in the complementary. And also, like with all of the hiring we did last year, what a hassle it was. When you say the seven elementary, are you pretty much thinking that we probably have some good souls here that we can move into that position or we're going to have to go out and hire and all the interviews and all that again? I believe we have some excellent candidates right here in the district who would fill some of those positions. Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> Very good. We'll look forward to seeing um, the uh, <laughs> increased uh, and the uh, specifics regarding the, that, that plan next week. At this point, item nine, board member comments. I don't have anything. Joyce? Joyce, do you have any? Yes, if I can find it. It's here somewhere. <clears throat> Enfield High School has been accepted into the, quote, Face of Connecticut, which is a geology program offered by Talgett Mountain Science Center. It's a tag STEM program. Each E Enfield High School students will participate in nine sessions and the program is also being offered to the TAG group at JFK. Very good. Donna? I'd just like to thank the, the board for voting unanimously to approve the architect that was selected by the building committee. They went through a lot of work. It's a lot of painstaking effort. It's a lot of understanding of explaining how things work in a different industry than we're used to. And uh, I think the, that it's, they appreciate very much the support of the board. And now you can ask them for anything you want in the building. <laughs> really? Well, I'd just like to uh, congratulate, again, the uh, student-athletes that we had here tonight, uh, a lot of accomplishments that they, uh, they did to receive these awards, but especially uh, Coach Gromich. Uh, I've known her for a lot of years. Uh, she coached my niece some five, six years ago, and she was one of the ones that went on to college. Uh, actually, she went to Quinnipiac to play field hockey. But uh, it's nice to see that we have coaches in our system that, that excel in getting these kids uh, accepted to these colleges. and and going through the sports program. She did a fantastic job. Tina. Um, keep an eye on the sports department um, that's coming out soon. They did an article on the Lady Patriots and the eighth grade girls that are um, moving on to high school next year. It was a really nice article. I got to see it. Um, so keep an eye out for that. And um, next Wednesday is McEducator Night for Eli Whitney. I'm sorry. It got canceled due to the weather. So next Wednesday, I believe, from 4 to 6 at the McDonald's by ShopRite. Oh, by, oh, by shop, right? Okay. Yep. I wasn't sure. Yep. There are so many. I know. <laughs> okay. I just have a couple of comments. One to the athletes and, and the coaches. I mean, it's always nice to do this. That's the uh, the gravy in, in our day here. And I think um, um, we have some wonderful students, and I don't think we tell them enough and see them enough to tell them about the good things. That's what we're here for, to provide those benefits. And these folks have taken advantage of it, and I'd just like to thank them. Secondly, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Tina and Donna. Uh, I know the thankless service they put in, the hours they put in, they're committed, and, and the dedication that they have and, and the, uh, the keen questions that they have for these people, they take it very, very seriously. And I feel confident uh, when, when we come back here and we have to vote on something, when I know that they vetted them very, very well. They treat it as their own money when they're going there and looking at it. And they're, they're doing it. And they're it. just beginning. I want them to stick around for a couple of years and stay with this commitment here. You know, this is very, very important here. And finally, just a bit of sad news, and I think people are aware of it now, that we lost one of our own here, uh, a longtime superintendent, Dr. Lewis Magger. Um, I, I knew Lou from the time that, um, I, actually about a year after he came, he hired me. And so I, I was very, very pleased to have that happen. And uh, I was honored when I retired that he came and spoke at my retirement party. Um, he was a wonderful man. He was a, a very, very quiet, unassuming man. Um, he, he wasn't in it for the glory, he was in it because he knew what was right for kids and he wanted to do what was right. Uh, he loved what he did, he was incredibly committed to public education, was very, very loyal to Enfield and Enfield students, 
and most importantly, he was a very, very good man. And I think we'll all miss him, and we owe him. A lot of the things we have in this town were really because of his leadership back in the 60s and 70s and, and, early, and 80s. And, um, you know, uh, we were privileged to know him. So we offer our condolences to his wife, Rita, and his kids. They all went to school here. Uh, and he started the 20-year terms Yes, he did. Superintendents. Actually, he did. He was here for 20 years, Dr. Gallagher, and that's so unusual for superintendents. So, yeah. I think, yeah. did you know that you signed up for a funding round in 77? Sure. I think they started down there. Okay. Uh, any, any other comments on the board? Hmm? Yes. Tim, they forgot to recognize these kids at the bottom. Yeah, the sports department. The sports department. Yeah. We still have their awards here. We still have their awards, the circled ones. Here. Okay. We'll make sure that happens at the next meeting, on Tuesday's meeting, okay? Okay. Can you put that on there? Yeah. We'll, we'll get out to Barry. That, that we, we will have do, to that. do that. Yeah. Thank you for sure. letting us know that. I'll we'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. A motion made to adjourn by Vinny, second by Donna. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> Any abstentions? Very good, folks. No, I think you should.